Good evening. We are thankful to have everyone here tonight and know this online platform has been beneficial, I know, to a lot of us, especially normally on Wednesdays. I'm working and about the only way I can view it is when I'm uh, in my vehicle and not on any calls, but I had the opportunity to be here tonight and want to thank everyone for being here and look forward to delivering this lesson. Tonight, you would be turning your Bibles to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7, keying in specifically on verses 3 through 7, but we will be looking at verses 1 through 7 of this particular passage. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is living peaceably. We live in a world of conflict, turmoil, and problems, and it seems that at every turn and everywhere we look, we're seeing something negative. We're seeing a lot of problems in our world and even particularly in our United States, though we may not be physically at war. We have internal wars going on in our country uh, with various false ideas, various ideologies, and just the general problems that we face. And how as Christians can we live in a world or even in this country, even with the freedoms we have and live peaceably? As I mentioned, everywhere we turn, we see violence, we see bloodshed, we see hatred, we see problems. But it is possible for us as Christians to live at peace. And primarily, as long as we have the peace with God, no matter what goes on in this world, then we are at peace. In Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, I'm going to look at that to begin with. We'll come back and pick verses 1 and 2 up a little bit later, and then we'll finish the sermon. But notice verses three through seven. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Just this small passage could provide us with a very lengthy lesson, but tonight, we're, since it is abbreviated, and we'll only touch on some highlights. If you look at our text, Paul is writing to Titus, a gospel preacher, and he's explaining to why, as to why we need to live the way we live and live faithful to God and peacefully among all men. Let's go back now to verses one and two, where he said, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. As we read verses one and two, it helps us to understand that we are subject, first of all, to a higher power and to the powers of this world. We're subject to God and his word, first and foremost. But when you go back to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, we are subject to principalities and powers and magistrates of this world. We have laws that we must follow. Someone recently asked me in a, a conversation about looking at some different areas and the work we do and implying that because I'm in law enforcement that I can do whatever I want. And I had to explain to them there are laws that all of us have to follow. Even us, we cannot violate people's rights or violate laws just because we wear a badge. So it is up to us to set the standard and the example to our fellow man in the work that I do to show them that we must also be law abiding. But folks, it comes to all of us to do those things. So when you go back to Romans chapter 13, it tells us exactly what Paul is telling Titus here, that we're subject. And he said, you put these people in mind to be subject to these principalities, powers, obey magistrates. But he also says, be ready to every good work. There are a lot of good works in this world that we can be doing. Sometimes we overlook them. Sometimes we shirk them. But there are good works that we need to be doing. And there are many times that we do those good works. And we should be doing that to the best of our ability while we live here. 
But if you contrast that also to Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, it says, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Now notice Paul is a realist. He said, as much as it be possible. Folks, there are just some people that don't want to be peaceable. There are some people you can try your hardest. You can be your kindest. You can fall backward and overboard to satisfy them. And there are some people who will never be satisfied. There are some who are just bound and determined to be evil, to make everyone's lives around them miserable as well as their own. But as much as lies in us, and it'd be possible, we do our part in living peacefully with all men. But why should we live peacefully with all men? Well, we know there's a contrast between peace and strife. We just looked at verse three, and this is real life strife. Because he says, for we ourselves, notice he said, were sometimes. And then he gives a list that we'll go through here just in a moment. We were these ways. We were doing these things that were wrong. But as Christians, after having obeyed the gospel, we put those things behind us. But the strifes of life are those who are, who are foolish. There's a lot of foolish people in this world. They're unwise. They're ignorant. They do things that are ungodly and wrong and many times know they're doing it. Some things can be done foolishly out of ignorance, but many of these people are doing things intentionally foolish in this life. They're disobedient as well. And we've been disobedient and we may still be at times, but if we're God's children, then we put it put behind us that disobedience. There are those that are disobedient to their parents. No matter what their parents tell them to do, they're going to do what they want to do, or at least they attempt to and growing up if I attempted to do what I wanted to do and it was against what my dad and my mom said then there was a swift rod of correction that was placed upon me and I learned better very quickly but there are some adults that continue in disobedience they allow their children to be in disobedience we see this on a regular basis you don't have to go very far at all before you see disobedient children to parents and the parents do nothing about it some parents even think it's cute when they disobey them until they get older and then the parents can't control them anymore. There are those that are disobedient, disobedient to the law, to the laws of this land. And they continue to commit crimes and do those things that they know that are wrong. But most importantly, there are those who are disobedient to God. And the only way to eternal life is to be obedient to God and faithful to his will. And yet there are those who are disobedient. There are those who are deceived. Deceived by their own hearts. Deceived by false teachers. Deceived by others. But they're still deceived. And folks, we don't want to be deceived. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, Be not deceived. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Don't be deceived in this life. Know what you're doing and live according to God's word. Then there are those in verse 3 that were serving divers' lusts and pleasures, indulging in corrupt or wrong types of passions of this life. And they continue to live in such ways. Then there are those who are living in malice and envy, living life of evilness and jealousy toward others. Then there are those who are hateful. I remember hearing that term a lot growing up. You don't be hateful to other people. In other words, you don't mistreat people. Or you don't get to the point that people don't like you because of the way you act. And hating one another. There are those who provoke hatred and in turn they hate other people as well. This is the contrast between peace and strife. Verse 3 shows a strife. But notice verse 4. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared. That kindness and love of God our Savior, Jesus Christ appeared. He appeared upon this earth and lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death on the cross. As he was nailed to the cross for our sins, having committed none himself, being the perfect sacrifice for us, he lived and died to be our Savior. And we need to be thankful for that. And as a result of his death on the cross, his burial and his resurrection, and ascension back into heaven, being the King of kings and Lord of lords, has offered us a beautiful home in heaven if we are obedient rather than disobedient. 
Now, if you compare 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through the first part of verse 11, it says, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But notice the very first part of verse 11, the first few words, and such were some of you. Notice again, past tense. These are the ones who are full of strife, causing problems, living in sin. And he told the Corinthians, this is the way that you were, but no longer. You made changes. And we know how that change came. That change came when they heard the message of the gospel and obeyed it. Look at verse five, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. This change came about as a result of obedience to the gospel. This change was not according to meritorious works. When it says not of works of righteousness, which we have done, we know that Jesus died on the cross for us and through his Shed blood has offered us eternal salvation when we obey. But these works, there are those who continue to talk about works don't save. Works cannot do anything for us. It's only by grace or it's only by faith or it's only by mercy. Folks, it's a combination of all of those things. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that grace only saves us. Nowhere in the Bible does it say faith only saves us. Nowhere in the Bible does it say mercy only saves us. There is that culmination of those things that show us that by God's mercy, through his grace, we can be saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10 even tells us that it was according to God's mercy, according to God's grace. But verse 10, he, he talks about our works. There are works, not meritorious works. We can't do good deeds or enough good deeds to save us. But we we commit ourselves to the work of faith, then God does save us as we obey the gospel. It is an obedient faith according to God's mercy when we do have that obedient faith that we're baptized, the washing of regeneration in Titus 3, 5, and renew of the Holy Spirit through the word which has been given to us. Now, if you go back again to 1 Corinthians 6, Verse 11, we looked at the first part of that verse. But he said, such were some of you, but you are washed. They were baptized. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. We obey the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. Having faith in Jesus Christ as a son of God, repenting of our sins, turning from those sins, and turning toward God. As we repent, we confess our faith in Jesus Christ. That we believe that Jesus Christ is a son of God. And we're willing to submit to his will. We do that through baptism. And as we're buried in the waters of baptism. We reach the blood of Christ that was shed in his death. Romans 6, 3 and 4. We arise to walk in newness of life. Verse 5. And we're saved by that precious blood. And we live a faithful Christian life to one day enjoy heaven as our home. Then we know about faithful and peaceful living. When you look at verses six and seven, which he shed upon us bundly through Jesus Christ, our savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That grace that brought salvation, Titus 2, 11 and 12 teaches us that we have to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, but live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what grace does for us. Grace is a teaching grace. It's not just saying, I believe in God through my faith and God through your grace, that's all I need and you can save me. But the grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. The grace teaches us that we're to live soberly, righteously, and godly. That's how God's grace saves us. We come in contact with the blood of Christ and we live a faithful life. 
over in Second Corinthians chapter one, verses two through four, says, "Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God. Justification uh, comes through grace." Romans five one. We understand that that grace does save us as we have obeyed that gospel. If you look at Romans 5.1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's writing to people who are already Christians. And therefore, having already been justified by faith, they obeyed the gospel. They had peace with God. And as we do that today, we have that peace with God. And if we want to live a life of peace rather than full of strife, we have to live an obedient, faithful Christian life. And we become heirs of eternal life. In Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7, Paul tells the Galatians, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We've talked tonight about how to have a peaceful life, how to live in peace, and primarily peace with God, and as much as possible, peace with man. And we live this peaceful life because we know the contrast between peace and strife. We know the change that's been wrought by God through his word that has given us that plan of salvation to save our souls. We also know the blessedness of having a faithful, peaceable life here upon this earth. And as a result, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, we become heirs of Abraham's seed according to the promise, through baptism. If you look at verses 27 through 29 of Galatians 3, it says, For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you're of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. May we understand that we do live in a world of strife and problems and turmoil. But as Christians, we can live that life of peace, no matter what goes on around us. And no matter how many times people try to pull us into that life of strife and that life of turmoil, we have to stand firm upon the principles of God's word to know that we're going to be faithful to God, serving him faithfully so that heaven can be our home. I want to thank you for your attention this evening.